Chapter 10 The plant was in Long Island, and I crossed a bridge in the fog to get there and came down in a stream of workers. Ahead of me a huge electric sign announced its message through the drifting strands of fog, Keep America Pure with Liberty Paints flags were fluttering in the breeze from each of a maze of buildings below the sign, and for a moment it was like watching some vast patriotic ceremony from a distance. But no shots were fired and no bugles sounded. I hurried ahead with the others through the fog. I was worried, since I had used Emerson's name without his permission, but when I found my way to the personnel office it worked like magic. I was interviewed by a little droopy-eyed man named Mr. McDuffie and sent to work for a Mr. Kimbrough. An office boy came along to direct me. If Kimbrough needs him, McDuffie told the boy, come back and have his name entered on the shipping department's payroll. It's tremendous, I said as we left the building. It looks like a small city. It's big all right, he said. We're one of the biggest outfits in the business. Make a lot of paint for the government. We entered one of the buildings now and started down a pure white hall. You better leave your things in the locker room, he said, opening a door through which I saw a room with low wooden benches and rows of green lockers. There were keys in several of the locks, and he selected one for me. Put your stuff in there and take the key, he said. Dressing, I felt nervous. He sprawled with one foot on a bench, watching me closely as he chewed on a match stem. Did he suspect that Emerson hadn't sent me? They have a new racket around here, he said, twirling the match between his finger and thumb. There was a note of insinuation in his voice, and I looked up from tying my shoe, breathing with conscious evenness. What kind of racket? I said. Oh, you know. The wise guys firing the regular guys and putting on you colored college boys. Pretty smart, he said. That way they don't have to pay union wages. How did you know I went to college? I said. Oh, there are about six of you guys out here already. Some up in the testing lab. Everybody knows about that. But I had no idea that was why I was hired, I said. Forget it, Mac, he said. It's not your fault. You new guys don't know the score. Just like the union says, it's the wise guys in the office. They're the ones who make scabs out of you, hey. We better hurry. We entered a long, shed-like room in which I saw a series of overhead doors along one side and a row of small offices on the other. I followed the boy down an aisle between endless cans, buckets and drums labeled with the company's trademark, a screaming eagle. The paint was stacked in neatly pyramided lots along the concrete floor. Then, starting into one of the offices, the boy stopped short and grinned. Listen to that. Someone inside the office was swearing violently over a telephone. Who's that? I asked. He grinned. Your boss, the terrible Mr. Kimbrough. We call him Colonel, but don't let him catch you. I didn't like it. The voice was raving about some failure of the laboratory and I felt a swift uneasiness. I didn't like the idea of starting to work for a man who was in such a nasty mood. Perhaps he was angry at one of the men from the school, and that wouldn't make him feel too friendly toward me. Let's go in, the boy said. I've got to get back. As we entered, the man slammed down the phone and picked up some papers. Mr. McDuffie wants to know if you can use this new man, the boy said. You damn right I can use him and... The voice trailed off, the eyes above the stiff military mustache going hard. Well, can you use him? The boy said. I got to go make out his card. Okay, the man said finally. I can use him. I gotta. What's his name? The boy read my name off a card. All right, he said. You go right to work. And you, he said to the boy, get the hell out of here before I give you a chance to earn some of the money wasted on you every payday. Aw, oh, Guan, you slave driver, the boy said, dashing from the room. Reddening, Kimbrough turned to me, come along, let's get going. I followed him into the long room where the lots of paint were stacked along the floor beneath numbered markers that hung from the ceiling. Toward the rear I could see two men unloading heavy buckets from a truck, stacking them neatly on a low loading platform. Now get this straight, 
Kimbra said gruffly. This is a busy department and I don't have time to repeat things. You have to follow instructions and you're going to be doing things you don't understand, so get your orders the first time and get them right. I won't have time to stop and explain everything. You have to catch on by doing exactly what I tell you. You got that? I nodded, noting that his voice became louder when the men across the floor stopped to listen. All right, he said, picking up several tools. Now come over here. He's Kimbro, one of the men said. I watched him kneel and open one of the buckets, stirring a milky brown substance. A nauseating stench arose. I wanted to step away. But he stirred it vigorously until it became glossy white, holding the spatula like a delicate instrument and studying the paint as it laced off the blade, back into the bucket. Kimbro frowned. Damn those laboratory blubberheads to hell. There's got to be dope put in every single sano fabiching bucket. And that's what you're going to do, and it's got to be put in so it can be trucked out of here before 11.30. He handed me a white enamel graduate and what looked like a battery hydrometer. The idea is to open each bucket and put in ten drops of this stuff, he said. Then you stir it till it disappears. After it's mixed you take this brush and paint out a sample on one of these. He produced a number of small rectangular boards and a small brush from his jacket pocket. You understand? Yes, sir. But when I looked into the white graduate I hesitated. The liquid inside was dead black. Was he trying to kid me? What's wrong? I don't know, sir. I mean. Well, I don't want to start by asking a lot of stupid questions, but do you know what's in this graduate? His eyes snapped. You damn right I know, he said. You just do what you're told. I just wanted to make sure, sir, I said. Look, he said drawing in his breath with an exaggerated show of patience. Take the dropper and fill it full. Go on, do it. I filled it. Now measure ten drops into the paint. There, that's it, not too goddamn fast. Now. You want no more than ten, and no less. Slowly, I measured the glistening black drops, seeing them settle upon the surface and become blacker still, spreading suddenly out to the edges. That's it. That's all you have to do, he said. Never mind how it looks. That's my worry. You just do what you're told and don't try to think about it. When you've done five or six buckets, come back and see if the samples are dry. And hurry, we've got to get this batch back off to Washington by 11.30. I worked fast but carefully. With a man like this Kimbro the least thing done incorrectly would cause trouble. So I wasn't supposed to think. To hell with him. Just a flunky, a northern redneck, a Yankee cracker. I mixed the paint thoroughly, then brushed it smoothly on one of the pieces of board, careful that the brush strokes were uniform. Struggling to remove an especially difficult cover, I wondered if the same Liberty paint was used on the campus, or if this optic white was something made exclusively for the government. Perhaps it was of a better quality, a special mix and in my mind I could see the brightly trimmed and freshly decorated campus buildings as they appeared on spring mornings, after the fall painting and the light winter snows, with a cloud riding over and a darting bird above, framed by the trees and encircling vines. The buildings had always seemed more impressive because they were the only buildings to receive regular paintings, usually. The nearby houses and cabins were left untouched to become the dull grain gray of weathered wood. And I remembered how the splinters in some of the boards were raised from the grain by the wind, the sun and the rain until the clapboards shone with a satiny, silvery, silverfish sheen. Like True Blood's Cabin, or The Golden Day. The Golden Day had once been painted white, now its paint was flaking away with the years, the scratch of a finger being enough to send it showering down. Damn that golden day. But it was strange how life connected up, because I had carried Mr. Norton to the old rundown building with rotting paint, I was here. If, I thought, one could slow down his heartbeats and memory to the tempo of the black drops falling so slowly into the bucket yet reacting so swiftly, it would seem like a sequence in a feverish dream. I was so deep in reverie that I failed to hear Kimbro approach. How's it coming? He said. 
standing with hands on hips. All right, sir. Let's see, he said, selecting a sample and running his thumb across the board. That's it, as white as George Washington's Sunday go to meet and wig and as sound as the almighty dollar. That's paint, he said proudly. That's paint that'll cover just about anything. He looked as though I had expressed a doubt and I hurried to say, it's certainly white all right. White. It's the purest white that can be found. Nobody makes a paint any whiter. This patch right here is heading for a national monument. I see, I said, quite impressed. He looked at his watch. Just keep it up, he said. If I don't hurry I'll be late for that production conference. Say, you're nearly out of dope, you'd better go in the tank room and refill it. And don't waste any time. I've got to go. He shot away without telling me where the tank room was. It was easy to find, but I wasn't prepared for so many tanks. There were seven, each with a puzzling code stenciled on it. It's just like Kimbrough not to tell me, I thought. You can't trust any of them. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll pick the tank from the contents of the drip cans hanging from the spigots. But while the first five tanks contained clear liquids that smelled like turpentine, the last two both contained something black like the dope, but with different codes. So I had to make a choice. Selecting the tank with the drip can that smelled most like the dope, I filled the graduate, congratulating myself for not having to waste time until Kimbrough returned. The work went faster now, the mixing easier. The pigment and heavy oils came free of the bottom much quicker, and when Kimbrough returned I was going at top speed. How many have you finished? He asked. About 75, I think, sir. I lost count. That's pretty good, but not fast enough. They've been putting pressure on me to get the stuff out. Here, I'll give you a hand. They must have given him hell, I thought as he got grunting to his knees and began removing covers from the buckets. But he had hardly started when he was called away. When he left I took a look at the last bunch of samples and got a shock, instead of the smooth, hard surface of the first, they were covered with a sticky goo through which I could see the grain of the wood. What on earth had happened? The paint was not as white and glossy as before, it had a gray tinge. I stirred it vigorously, then grabbed a rag wiping each of the boards clean, then made a new sample of each bucket. I grew panicky lest Kimbrough return before I finished. Working feverishly, I made it, but since the paint required a few minutes to dry I picked up two finished buckets and started lugging them over to the loading platform. I dropped them with a thump as the voice rang out behind me. It was Kimbrough. What the hell? He yelled, smearing his finger over one of the samples. This stuff's still wet. I didn't know what to say. He snatched up several of the later samples, smearing them, and letting out a groan. Of all the things to happen to me. First they take all my good men and then they send me you. What did you do to it? Nothing, sir. I followed your directions, I said defensively. I watched him peer into the graduate, lifting the dropper and sniffing it, his face glowing with exasperation. Who the hell gave you this? No one. Then where'd you get it? From the tank room. Suddenly he dashed for the tank room, sloshing the liquid as he ran. I thought, oh, hell, and before I could follow, he burst out of the door in a frenzy. You took the wrong tank, he shouted. What the hell, you trying to sabotage the company? That stuff wouldn't work in a million years. It's remover, concentrated remover. Don't you know the difference? No, sir, I don't. It looked the same to me. I didn't know what I was using and you didn't tell me. I was trying to save time and took what I thought was right. But why this one? Because it smelled the same, I began. Smelt it. He roared. God damn it, don't you know you can't smell shit around all those fumes? Come on to my office. I was torn between protesting and pleading for fairness. It was not all my fault and I didn't want the blame, but I did wish to finish out the day. Throbbing with anger I followed, listening as he called personnel. Hello? Mac? Mac, this is Kimbrough. It's about this fellow you sent me this morning. I'm sending him in to pick up his pay. 
What did he do? He doesn't satisfy me, that's what. I don't like his work. So the old man has to have a report, so what? Make him one. Tell him God damn it this fellow ruined a batch of government stuff, hey. No, don't tell him that. Listen, Mac, you got anyone else out there? Okay, forget it. He crashed down the phone and swung toward me. I swear I don't know why they hire you fellows. You just don't belong in a paint plant. Come on. Bewildered, I followed him into the tank room, yearning to quit and tell him to go to hell. But I needed the money, and even though this was the North I wasn't ready to fight unless I had to. Here I'd be one against how many? I watched him empty the graduate back into the tank and noted carefully when he went to another marked SKA-369-TY and refilled it. Next time I would know. Now, for God's sake, he said, handing me the graduate, be careful and try to do the job right. And if you don't know what to do, ask somebody. I'll be in my office. I returned to the buckets, my emotions whirling. Kimbrough had forgotten to say what was to be done with the spoiled paint. Seeing it there I was suddenly seized by an angry impulse, and, filling the dropper with fresh dope, I stirred ten drops into each bucket and pressed home the covers. Let the government worry about that, I thought, and started to work on the unopened buckets. I stirred until my arm ached and painted the samples as smoothly as I could, becoming more skillful as I went along. When Kimbrough came down the floor and watched I glanced up silently and continued stirring. How is it? He said, frowning. I don't know, I said, picking up a sample and hesitating. Well? It's nothing. A speck of dirt, I said, standing and holding out the sample, a tightness growing within me. Holding it close to his face, he ran his fingers over the surface and squinted at the texture. That's more like it, he said. That's the way it ought to be. I watched with a sense of unbelief as he rubbed his thumb over the sample, handed it back and left without a further word. I looked at the painted slab. It appeared the same, a gray tinge glowed through the whiteness, and Kimbrough had failed to detect it. I stared for about a minute, wondering if I were seeing things, inspected another and another. All were the same, a brilliant white diffused with gray. I closed my eyes for a moment and looked again and still no change. Well, I thought, as long as he's satisfied. But I had a feeling that something had gone wrong, something far more important than the paint, that either I had played a trick on Kimbrough or he, like the trustees and Bledsoe, was playing one on me. When the truck backed up to the platform I was pressing the cover on the last bucket, and there stood Kimbrough above me. Let's see your samples he said. I reached, trying to select the whitest, as the blue-shirted truckman climbed through the loading door. How about it, Kimbrough, one of them said, can we get started? Just a minute, now, he said, studying the sample, just a minute. I watched him nervously, waiting for him to throw a fit over the great hinge and hating myself for feeling nervous and afraid. What would I say? But now he was turning to the truckman. All right, boys get the hell out of here. And you, he said to me, go see McDuffie, you're through. I stood there, staring at the back of his head, at the pink neck beneath the cloth cap and the iron gray hair. So he'd let me stay only to finish the mixing. I turned away, there was nothing that I could do. I cursed him all the way to the personnel office. Should I write the owners about what had happened? Perhaps they didn't know that Kimbrough was having so much to do with the quality of the paint. But upon reaching the office I changed my mind. Perhaps that is how things are done here, I thought, perhaps the real quality of the paint is always determined by the man who ships it rather than by those who mix it. To hell with the whole thing. I'll find another job. But I wasn't fired. McDuffie sent me to the basement of building number two on a new assignment. When you get down there just tell Brockway that Mr. Sparland insists that he have an assistant. You do whatever he tells you. What is that name again, sir? I said. Lucius Brockway, he said. He's in charge. It was a deep basement. Three levels underground I pushed upon a heavy metal door marked danger and descended into a noisy, dimly lit room. 
There was something familiar about the fumes that filled the air and I had just thought pine, when a high-pitched negro voice rang out above the machine sounds. Who you looking for down here? I'm looking for the man in charge, I called, straining to locate the voice. You talking to him? What you want? The man who moved out of the shadow and looked at me sullenly was small, wiry and very natty in his dirty overalls. And as I approached him I saw his drawn face and the cottony white hair showing beneath his tight, striped engineer's cap. His manner puzzled me. I couldn't tell whether he felt guilty about something himself, or thought I had committed some crime. I came closer, staring. He was barely five feet tall, his overalls looking now as though he had been dipped in pitch. All right, he said. I'm a busy man. What you want? I'm looking for Lucius, I said. He frowned. That's me, and don't come calling me by my first name. To you and all like you I'm Mr. Brockway. You? I began. Yeah, me. Who sent you down here anyway? The personnel office, I said. I was told to tell you that Mr. Sparlin said for you to be given an assistant. Assistant? He said. I don't need no damn assistant. Old man Sparlin must think I'm getting old as him. Here I've been running things by myself all these years and now they keep trying to send me some assistant. You get on back up there and tell him that when I want an assistant I'll ask for one. I was so disgusted to find such a man in charge that I turned without a word and started back up the stairs. First Kimbro, I thought, and now this old. Hey. Wait a minute. I turned, seeing him beckon. Come on back here a minute, he called, his voice cutting sharply through the roar of the furnaces. I went back, seeing him remove a white cloth from his hip pocket and wipe the glass face of a pressure gauge, then bend close to squint at the position of the needle. Here, he said, straightening and handing me the cloth, you can stay till I can get in touch with the old man. These here have to be kept clean so's I can see how much pressure I'm getting. I took the cloth without a word and began rubbing the glasses. He watched me critically. What's your name? He said. I told him, shouting it in the roar of the furnaces. Wait a minute, he called, going over and turning a valve in an intricate network of pipes. I heard the noise rise to a higher, almost hysterical pitch, somehow making it possible to hear without yelling, our voices moving blurrily underneath. Returning, he looked at me sharply his withered face an animated black walnut with shrewd, reddish eyes. This here's the first time they ever sent me anybody like you, he said as though puzzled. That's how come I called you back. Usually they sends down some young white fellow who thinks he's going to watch me a few days and ask me a heap of questions and then take over. Some folks is too damn simple to even talk about, he said, grimacing and waving his hand in a violent gesture of dismissal. You an engineer? He said, looking quickly at me. An engineer? Yeah, that's what I asked you, he said challengingly. Why, no, sir, I'm no engineer. You show? Of course I'm sure. Why shouldn't I be? He seemed to relax. That's all right then. I have to watch them personnel fellows. One of them thinks he's going to get me out of here, when he ought to know by now he's wasting his time. Lucius Brockway not only intends to protect his self, he knows how to do it. Everybody knows I've been here ever since there's been a here, even helped dig the first foundation. The old man hired me, nobody else, and, by God, it'll take the old man to fire me. I rubbed away at the gauges, wondering what had brought on this outburst, and was somewhat relieved that he seemed to hold nothing against me personally. Where you go to school? He said. I told him. Is that so? What you learning down there? Just general subjects, a regular college course, I said. Mechanics? Oh no, nothing like that, just a liberal arts course. No trades. Is that so? He said doubtfully. Then suddenly, how much pressure I got on that gauge right there. Which? You see it, he pointed. That one right there. I looked, calling off. 43 and 2 tenths pounds. Ha, huh, ha, huh, that's right. He squinted at the gauge and back at me. 
where you learn to read a gauge so good. In my high school physics class, it's like reading a clock. They teach you that in high school? That's right. Well, that's going to be one of your jobs. These here gauges have to be checked every 15 minutes. You ought to be able to do that. I think I can, I said. Some can, some can't. By the way, who hired you? Mr. McDuffie, I said, wondering why all the questions. Yeah, then where you been all morning? I was working over in building number one. That there's a heap of building. Whereabouts? For Mr. Kimbrough. I see, I see. I know they oughtn't to be hiring anybody this late in the day. What Kimbrough have you doing? Putting dope in some paint that went bad, I said wearily, annoyed with all the questions. His lips shot out belligerently. What paint went bad? I think it was some for the government. He cocked his head. I wonder how come nobody said nothing to me about it, he said thoughtfully. Was it in buckets or them little bitty cans? Buckets. Oh, that ain't so bad, them little ones is a heap of work. He gave me a high dry laugh. How you hear about this job? He snapped suddenly, as though trying to catch me off guard. Look, I said slowly, a man I know told me about the job, McDuffie hired me, I worked this morning for Mr. Kimbrough, and I was sent to you by Mr. McDuffie. His face tightened. You friends to one of those colored fellows? Who? Up in the lab? No, I said. Anything else you want to know? He gave me a long, suspicious look and spat upon a hot pipe, causing it to steam furiously. I watched him remove a heavy engineer's watch from his breast pocket and squint at the dial importantly, then turn to check it with an electric clock that glowed from the wall. You keep on wiping them gauges, he said. I got to look at my soup. And look here. He pointed to one of the gauges. I want you to keep a specially sharp eye on this here son of a bitch. The last couple of days he's developed a habit of building up too fast. Causes me a heap of trouble. You see him getting past 75, you yell, and yell loud. He went back into the shadows and I saw a shaft of brightness mark the opening of a door. Running the rag over a gauge I wondered how an apparently uneducated old man could gain such a responsible job. He certainly didn't sound like an engineer, yet he alone was on duty. And you could never be sure. For at home an old man employed as a janitor at the waterworks was the only one who knew the location of all of the water mains. He had been employed at the beginning, before any records were kept, and actually functioned as an engineer though he drew a janitor's pay. Perhaps this old Brockway was protecting himself from something. After all, there was antagonism to our being employed. Maybe he was dissimulating, like some of the teachers at the college, who to avoid trouble when driving through the small surrounding towns, wore chauffeur caps and pretended that their cars belonged to white men. But why was he pretending with me? And what was his job? I looked around me. It was not just an engine room, I knew, for I had been in several, the last at college. It was something more. For one thing, the furnaces were made differently and the flames that flared through the cracks of the fire chambers were too intense and too blue. And there were the odors. No, he was making something down here, something that had to do with paint, and probably something too filthy and dangerous for white men to be willing to do even for money. It was not paint because I had been told that the paint was made on the floors above, where, passing through. I had seen men in splattered aprons working over large vats filled with whirling pigment. One thing was certain, I had to be careful with this crazy Brockway, he didn't like my being here. And there he was, entering the room now from the stairs. How's it going? He asked. All right, I said. Only it seems to have gotten louder. Oh, it gets pretty loud down here, all right, this here's the uproar department and I'm in charge. Did she go over the mark? No, it's holding steady, I said. That's good. I've been having plenty trouble with it lately. Have it to bust it down and give it a good going over soon as I can get the tank clear. Perhaps he is the engineer, I thought, 
watching him inspect the gauges and go to another part of the room to adjust a series of valves, then he went and said a few words into a wall phone and called me, pointing to the valves. I'm fixing to shoot it to him upstairs, he said gravely. When I give you the signal I want you to turn them wide open. And when I give you the second signal I want you to close them up again. Start with this here red one and work right straight across. I took my position and waited, as he took a stand near the gauge. Let her go, he called. I opened the valves, hearing the sound of liquids rushing through the huge pipes. At the sound of a buzzer I looked up. Start closing, he yelled. What you looking at? Close them valves. What's wrong with you? He asked when the last valve was closed. I expected you to call. I said I'd signal you. Can't you tell the difference between a signal and a call? Hell, I buzzed you. You don't want to do that no more. When I buzz you I want you to do something and do it quick. You're the boss, I said sarcastically. You mighty right, I'm the boss, and don't forget it. Now come on back here, we got work to do. We came to a strange looking machine consisting of a huge set of gears connecting a series of drum like rollers. Brockway took a shovel and scooped up a load of brown crystals from a pile on the floor, pitching them skillfully into a receptacle on top of the machine. Grab a scoop and let's get going, he ordered briskly. You ever done this before? He asked as I scooped into the pile. It's been a long time, I said. What is this material? He stopped shoveling and gave me a long, black stare, then returned to the pile, his scoop ringing on the floor. You'll have to remember not to ask this suspicious old bastard any questions, I thought, scooping into the brown pile. Soon I was perspiring freely. My hands were sore and I began to tire. Brockway watched me out of the corner of his eye, snickering noiselessly. You don't want to overwork yourself, young feller, he said blandly. I'll get used to it, I said, scooping up a heavy load. Oh, show, show, he said show. But you better take a rest when you get tired. I didn't stop. I piled on the material until he said, that there's the scoop we've been trying to find. That's what we want. You better stand back a little, cuz I'm fixing to start her up. I backed away, watching him go over and push a switch. Shuddering into motion, the machine gave a sudden scream like a circular saw, and sent a tattoo of sharp crystals against my face. I moved clumsily away, seeing Brockway grin like a dried prune. Then with the dying hum of the furiously whirling drums, I heard the grain sifting lazily in the sudden stillness, sliding sand-like down the chute into the pot underneath. I watched him go over and open a valve. A sharp new smell of oil arose. Now she's all set to cook down, all we got to do is put the fire to her, he said pressing a button on something that looked like the burner of an oil furnace. There was an angry hum, followed by a slight explosion that caused something to rattle, and I could hear a low roaring begin. Know what that's going to be when it's cooked? No, sir, I said. Well that's going to be the guts, what they call the vehicle of the paint. Least it will be by time I get through putting other stuff with it. But I thought the paint was made upstairs. Nah. They just mixes in the color, make it look pretty. Right down here is where the real paint is made. Without what I do they couldn't do nothing, they be making bricks without straw. And not only do I make up the base, I fixes the varnishes and lots of the oils too. So that's it, I said. I was wondering what you did down here. A whole lots of folks wonders about that without getting anywhere. But as I was saying, can't a single doggone drop of paint move out of the factory lesson it comes through Lucius Brockway's hands. How long have you been doing this? Long enough to know what I'm doing, he said. And I learned it without all that education that them what's been sent down here is supposed to have. I learned it by doing it. Them personnel fellows don't want to face the facts, but Liberty Paints wouldn't be worth a plugged nickel if they didn't have me here to see that it got a good strong base. Old man Sparlin know it though. I can't stop laughing over the time when I was down with a touch of pneumonia and they put one of them so-called engineers to pooling around down here. 
Why, they started to having so much paint go bad they didn't know what to do. Paint was bleeding and wrinkling, wouldn't cover or nothing, you know, a man could make his self all kinds of money if he found out what makes paint bleed. Anyway, everything was going bad. Then word got to me that they done put that fellow in my place and when I got well I wouldn't come back. Here I been with him so long and loyal and everything. Shucks, I just sent him word that Lucius Brockway was retiring. Next thing you know here come the old man. He's so old his self his chauffeur has to help him up them steep stairs at my place. Come in a puffing and a blowing, says, Lucius, what's this I hear about you retiring? Well, sir, Mr. Sparland, sir, I says, I've been pretty sick, as you well know, and I'm getting kinder along in my years, as you well know, and I hear that this here Italian fellow you got in my place is doing so good I thought I'd might as well take it easy round the house. Why, you day thought I'd done cursed him or something. What kind of talk is that from you, Lucius Brockway, he said, taking it easy round the house when we need you out to the plant? Don't you know the quickest way to die is to retire? Why, that fellow out at the plant don't know a thing about those furnaces. I'm so worried about what he's going to do, that he's liable to blow up the plant or something that I took out some extra insurance. He can't do your job, he said. He don't have the touch. We haven't put out a first-class patch of paint since you've been gone. Now that was the old man himself. Lucius Brockway said. So what happened? I said. What you mean, what happened? He said, looking as though it were the most unreasonable question in the world. Shucks, a few days later the old man had me back down here in full control. That engineer got so mad when he found out he had to take orders from me he quit the next day. He spat on the floor and laughed. Hey, 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 he was a fool, that's what. A fool. He wanted to boss me and I know more about this basement than anybody, boilers and everything. I helped lay the pipes and everything, and what I mean is I knows the location of each and every pipe and switch and cable and wire and everything else, both in the floors and in the walls and out in the yard. Yes, sir. And what's more, I got it in my head so good I can trace it out on paper down to the last nut and bolt and ain't never been to nobody's engineering school neither, ain't even passed by one, as far as I know. Now what you think about that? I think it's remarkable, I said, thinking, I don't like this old man. Oh, I wouldn't call it that, he said. It's just that I've been round here so long. I've been studying this machinery for over 25 years. Show. And that fellow thinking cause he been to some school and learned how to read a blueprint and how to fire a boiler he knows more about this plant than Lucius Brockway. That fool couldn't make no engineer cause he can't see what's staring him straight in the face. Say, you forgiven to watch them gauges. I hurried over, finding all the needles steady. They're okay, I called. All right, but I'm warning you to keep an eye on them. You can't forget down here. Cause if you do, you liable to blow up something. They got all this machinery, but that ain't everything, we are the machines inside the machine. You know the best selling paint we got, the one that made this here business? He asked as I helped him fill a vat with a smelly substance. No, I don't. Our white, optic white. Why the white rather than the others? Cause we started stressing it from the first. We make the best white paint in the world. I don't give a damn what nobody says. Our white is so white you can paint a chunk of coal and you'd have to crack it open with a sledgehammer to prove it wasn't white clear through. His eyes glinted with humorless conviction and I had to drop my head to hide my grin. You notice that sign on top of the building? Oh, you can't miss that, I said. You read the slogan? I don't remember, I was in such a hurry. Well, you might not believe it. But I helped the old man make up that slogan. If it's optic white, it's the right white, he quoted with an upraised finger, like a preacher quoting holy writ. I got me a $300 bonus for helping to think that up. These newfangled advertising folks has been trying to work up something about the other colors, 
talking about rainbows or something, but hell, they can't get nowhere. If it's optic white, it's the right white, I repeated and suddenly had to repress a laugh as a childhood jingle rang through my mind, if you're white, you're right, I said. That's it, he said. And that's another reason why the old man ain't going to let nobody come down here messing with me. He knows what a lot of them new fellers don't, he knows that the reason our paint is so good is because of the way Lucius Brockway puts the pressure on the oils and resins before they even leaves the tanks. He laughed maliciously. They thinks cause everything down here is done by machinery, that's all there is to it. They crazy. Ain't a continental thing that happens down here that ain't as fun I done put my black hands into it. Them machines just do the cooking, these here hands right here do the sweeting. Yes, sir. Lucius Brockway hit it square on the head. I dips my fingers in and sweets it. Come on, let's eat. But what about the gauges? I said, seeing him go over and take a thermos bottle from a shelf near one of the furnaces. Oh. We'll be here close enough to keep an eye on them. Don't you worry about that. But I left my lunch in the locker room over at building number one. Go on and get it and come back here and eat. Down here we have to always be on the job. A man don't need no more than 15 minutes to eat no how. Then I say let him get on back on the job. Up on opening the door I thought I had made a mistake. Men dressed in splattered painters' caps and overalls sat about on benches, listening to a thin tubercular-looking man who was addressing them in a nasal voice. Everyone looked at me and I was starting out when the thin man called, There's plenty of seats for late commerce. Come in, brother. Brother? Even after my weeks in the North this was surprising. I was looking for the locker room, I spluttered. You're in it, brother. Weren't you told about the meeting? meeting? Why, no, sir, I wasn't. The chairman frowned. You see, the bosses are not cooperating, he said to the others. Brother, who's your foreman? Mr. Brockway, sir, I said. Suddenly the men began scraping their feet and cursing. I looked about me. What was wrong? Were they objecting to my referring to Brockway as Mr.? Quiet, brothers, the chairman said, leaning across his table his hand cupped to his ear. Now what was that, brother, who is your foreman? Lucius Brockway, sir, I said, dropping the mister. But this seemed only to make them more hostile. Get him the hell out of here, they shouted. I turned. A group on the far side of the room kicked over a bench, yelling, throw him out. Throw him out. I inched backwards, hearing the little man bang on the table for order. Men, brothers. Give the brother a chance. He looks like a dirty fink to me. A first-class enameled fink. The hoarsely voiced word grated my ears like nigger in an angry southern mouth. Brothers, please. The chairman was waving his hands as I reached out behind me for the door and touched an arm, feeling it snatch violently away. I dropped my hand. Who sent this fink into the meeting, brother chairman? Ask him that. A man demanded. No, wait, the chairman said. Don't try that word too hard. Ask him, brother chairman. Another man said. Okay, but don't label a man a fink until you know for sure. The chairman turned to me. How'd you happen in here, brother? The men quieted, listening. I left my lunch in my locker, I said, my mouth dry. You weren't sent into the meeting? No, sir. I didn't know about any meeting. The hell he says. None of these finks ever knows. Throw the lousy bastard out. Now, wait, I said. They became louder, threatening. Respect the chair. The chairman shouted. We're a democratic union here, following democratic, never mind, get rid of the fink. Procedures. It's our task to make friends with all the workers. And I mean all. That's how we build the union strong. Now let's hear what the brothers got to say. No more of that beefing and interrupting. I broke into a cold sweat, my eyes seeming to have become extremely sharp, causing each face to stand out vivid in its hostility. I heard, when were you hired, friend? This morning, I said. See, brothers, he's a new man. 
we don't want to make the mistake of judging the worker by his foreman. Some of you also work for San Sabaches, remember? Suddenly the men began to laugh and curse. Here's one right here, one of them yelled. Mine wants to marry the boss's daughter, a frigging eight-day wonder. This sudden change made me puzzled and angry, as though they were making me the butt of a joke. Order, brothers. Perhaps the brother would like to join the union. How about it, brother? Sir? I didn't know what to say. I knew very little about unions, but most of these men seemed hostile. And before I could answer a fat man with shaggy gray hair leaped to his feet, shouting angrily, I'm against it. Brothers, this fellow could be a fink, even if he was hired right this minute. Not that I aim to be unfair to anybody, either. Maybe he ain't a fink, he cried passionately, but brothers, I want to remind you that nobody knows it, and it seems to me that anybody that would work under that saw no fabiching, double-crossing Brockway for more than fifteen minutes is just as apt as not to be naturally fink-minded. Please, brothers! He cried, waving his arms for quiet. As some of you brothers have learned, to the sorrow of your wives and babies, a fink don't have to know about trade unionism to be a fink. Finkism. Hell, I've made a study of finkism. Finkism is born into some guys. It's born into some guys, just like a good eye for color is born into other guys. That's right, that's the honest, scientific truth. A fink don't even have to have heard of a union before, he cried in a frenzy of words. All you have to do is bring him around the neighborhood of a union and next thing you know, why, zip. He's thinking his thinking ass off. He was drowned out by shouts of approval. Men turned violently to look at me. I felt choked. I wanted to drop my head but faced them as though facing them was itself a denial of his statements. Another voice ripped out of the shouts of approval, spilling with great urgency from the lips of a little fellow with glasses who spoke with the index finger of one hand upraised and the thumb of the other crooked in the suspender of his overalls. I want to put this brother's remarks in the form of a motion, I move that we determine through a thorough investigation whether the new worker is a fink or no, and if he is a fink, let us discover who he's thinking for. And this, brother members, would give the worker time, if he ain't a fink, to become acquainted with the work of the union and its aims. After all, brothers, we don't want to forget that workers like him aren't so highly developed as some of us who've been in the labor movement for a long time. So I says, let's give him time to see what we've done to improve the condition of the workers, and then, if he ain't a fink, we can decide in a democratic way whether we want to accept this brother into the union. Brother union members, I thank you. He sat down with a bump. The room roared. Biting anger grew inside me. So I was not so highly developed as they. What did he mean? Were they all PhDs? I couldn't move, too much was happening to me. It was as though by entering the room I had automatically applied for membership even though I had no idea that a union existed, and had come up simply to get a cold pork chop sandwich. I stood trembling, afraid that they would ask me to join but angry that so many rejected me on sight. And worst of all, I knew they were forcing me to accept things on their own terms, and I was unable to leave. All right, brothers. We'll take a vote, the chairman shouted. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying I. The eyes drowned him out. The eyes carried it, the chairman announced as several men turned to stare at me. At last I could move. I started out, forgetting why I had come. Come in, brother, the chairman called. You can get your lunch now. Let him through, you brothers around the door. My face stung as though it had been slapped. They had made their decision without giving me a chance to speak for myself. I felt that every man present looked upon me with hostility, and though I had lived with hostility all my life, now for the first time it seemed to reach me, as though I had expected more of these men than of others, even though I had not known of their existence. Here in this room my defenses were negated, stripped away, checked at the door as the weapons, the knives and razors and owlhead pistols of the country boys were checked on Saturday night at the Golden Day. I kept my eyes lowered mumbling pardon me, pardon me, 
all the way to the drab green locker, where I removed the sandwich, for which I no longer had an appetite, and stood fumbling with the bag, dreading to face the men on my way out. Then still hating myself for the apologies made coming over, I brushed past silently as I went back. When I reached the door the chairman called, Just a minute, brother, we want you to understand that this is nothing against you personally. What you see here is the results of certain conditions here at the plant. We want you to know that we are only trying to protect ourselves. Some day we hope to have you as a member in good standing. From here and there came a half-hearted applause that quickly died. I swallowed and stared unseeing, the words spurting to me from the red, misty distance. Okay, brothers, the voice said, let him pass. I stumbled through the bright sunlight of the yard, past the office workers chatting on the grass, back to building number two, to the basement. I stood on the stairs, feeling as though my bowels had been flooded with acid. Why hadn't I simply left? I thought with anguish. And since I had remained, why hadn't I said something, defended myself? Suddenly I snatched the wrapper off a sandwich and tore it violently with my teeth, hardly tasting the dry lumps that squeezed past my constricted throat when I swallowed. Dropping the remainder back into the bag, I held on to the handrail, my legs shaking as though I had just escaped a great danger. Finally, it went away and I pushed open the metal door. What kept you so long? Brockway snapped from where he sat on a wheelbarrow. He had been drinking from a white mug now cupped in his grimy hands. I looked at him abstractedly, seeing how the light caught on his wrinkled forehead, his snowy hair. I said, what kept you so long? What had he to do with it, I thought, looking at him through a kind of mist, knowing that I disliked him and that I was very tired. I say. He began and I heard my voice come quiet from my tensed throat as I noticed by the clock that I had been gone only twenty minutes. I ran into a union meeting, union. I heard his white cup shatter against the floor as he uncrossed his legs, rising. I knowed you belong to that bunch of troublemaking foreigners. I knowed it. Get out. He screamed. Get out of my basement. He started toward me as in a dream trembling like the needle of one of the gauges as he pointed toward the stairs, his voice shrieking. I stared, something seemed to have gone wrong, my reflexes were jammed. But what's the matter? I stammered, my voice low and my mind understanding and yet failing exactly to understand. What's wrong? You heard me. Get out. But I don't understand. Shut up and get. But, Mr. Brockway, I cried fighting to hold something that was giving way. You two bit, trouble-making union louse. Look, man, I cried, urgently now, I don't belong to any union. If you don't get out of here, you low down skunk, he said, looking wildly about the floor, I'm liable to kill you. The Lord being my witness, I'll kill you. It was incredible, things were speeding up. You'll do what? I stammered. I'll kill you, that's what. He had said it again and something fell away from me, and I seemed to be telling myself in a rush, you were trained to accept the foolishness of such old men as this, even when you thought them clowns and fools, you were trained to pretend that you respected them and acknowledged in them the same quality of authority and power in your world as the whites before whom they bowed and scraped and feared and loved and imitated, and you were even trained to accept it when, angered or spiteful, or drunk with power. They came at you with a stick or strap or cane and you made no effort to strike back, but only to escape unmarked. But this was too much. He was not grandfather or uncle or father, nor preacher or teacher. Something uncoiled in my stomach and I was moving toward him, shouting, more at a black blur that irritated my eyes than at a clearly dent human face, you'll kill WHO? You, that's WHO. Listen here. You old fool, don't talk about killing me. Give me a chance to explain. I don't belong to anything, go on, pick it up. Go on. I yelled, seeing his eyes fasten upon a twisted iron bar. You're old enough to be my grandfather, but if you touch that bar, I swear I'll make you eat it. I done told you, get out of my basement. You impudent son bitch, he screamed. I moved forward 
seeing him stoop and reach aside for the bar, and I was throwing myself forward, feeling him go over with a grunt, hard against the floor, rolling beneath the force of my lunge. It was as though I had landed upon a wiry rat. He scrambled beneath me, making angry sounds and striking my face as he tried to use the bar. I twisted it from his grasp, feeling a sharp pain stab through my shoulder. He's using a knife flashed through my mind and I slashed out with my elbow, sharp against his face, feeling it land solid and seeing his head fly backwards and up and back again as I struck again, hearing something fly free and skitter across the floor, thinking, it's gone, the knife is gone. And struck again as he tried to choke me, jabbing at his bobbing head, feeling the bar come free and bringing it down at his head, missing, the metal clinking against the floor and bringing it up for a second try and him yelling, No, no. You the best, you the best. I'm going to beat your brains out. I said, my throat dry, stabbing me. No, he panted. I got enough. Ain't you heard me say I got enough? So when you can't win you want to stop. Damn you, if you've cut me bad, I'll tear your head off. Watching him warily, I got to my feet. I dropped the bar. As a flash of heat swept over me, his face was caved in. What's wrong with you, old man? I yelled nervously. Don't you know better than to attack a man a third your age? He blanched at being called old, and I repeated it, adding insults I'd heard my grandfather use. Why, you old-fashioned, slavery time, mammy made, handkerchief-headed bastard, you should know better. What made you think you could threaten my life? You meant nothing to me, I came down here because I was sent. I didn't know anything about you or the union either. Why'd you start riding me the minute I came in? Are you people crazy? Does this paint go to your head? Are you drinking it? He glared, panting tiredly. Great tucks showed in his overalls where the folds were stuck together by the goo with which he was covered, and I thought, tar baby, and wanted to blot him out of my sight. But now my anger was flowing fast from action to words. I go to get my lunch and they ask me who I work for and when I tell them, they call me a fink. A fink. You people must be out of your minds. No sooner do I get back down here than you start yelling that you're going to kill me. What's going on? What have you got against me? What did I do? He glowered at me silently, then pointed to the floor. Reach and draw back a nub. I warned. Can't a man even get his teeth? He mumbled, his voice strange. Teeth? With a shamed frown, he opened his mouth. I saw a blue flash of shrunken gums. The thing that had skittered across the floor was not a knife, but a plate of false teeth. For a fraction of a second I was desperate, feeling some of my justification for wanting to kill him slipping away. My fingers leaped to my shoulder finding wet cloth but no blood. The old fool had bitten me. A wild flash of laughter struggled to rise from beneath my anger. He had bitten me. I looked on the floor, seeing the smashed mug and the teeth glinting dully across the room. Get them, I said, growing ashamed. Without his teeth, some of the hatefulness seemed to have gone out of him. But I stayed close as he got his teeth and went over to the tap and held them beneath a stream of water. A tooth fell away beneath the pressure of his thumb, and I heard him grumbling as he placed the plate in his mouth. Then, wiggling his chin, he became himself again. You was really trying to kill me, he said. He seemed unable to believe it. You started the killing. I don't go around fighting, I said. Why didn't you let me explain? Is it against the law to belong to the Union? That damn Union, he cried, almost in tears that damn union. They after my job. I know they after my job. For one of us to join one of them damn unions is like we was to bite the hand of the man who teached us to bathe in a bathtub. I hates it, and I mean to keep on doing all I can to chase it out of the plant. They after my job, the chicken shit bastards. Spittle formed at the corners of his mouth, he seemed to boil with hatred. But what have I to do with that? I said feeling suddenly the older. Cause them young colored fellers up in the lab is trying to join that outfit, that's what. 
Here the white man don't give em jobs, he wheezed as though pleading a case. He don't give em good jobs too, and they so ungrateful they goes and joins up with that backbiting union. I never seen such a no good ungrateful bunch. All they doing is making things bad for the rest of us. Well, I'm sorry, I said, I didn't know about all that. I came here to take a temporary job and I certainly didn't intend to get mixed up in any quarrels. But as for us, I'm ready to forget our disagreement, if you are. I held out my hand, causing my shoulder to pain. He gave me a gruff look. You ought to have more self-respect than to fight an old man, he said. I got grown boys older than you. I thought you were trying to kill me, I said, my hand still extended. I thought you had stabbed me. Well, I don't like a lot of bickering and confusion myself, he said, avoiding my eyes. And it was as though the closing of his sticky hand over mine was a signal. I heard a shrill hissing from the boilers behind me and turned, hearing Brockway yell, I told you to watch them gauges. Get over to the big valves, quick. I dashed for where a series of valve wheels projected from the wall near the crusher, seeing Brockway scrambling away in the other direction, thinking, where is he going? As I reached the valves, and hearing him yell, turn it. Turn it. Which? I yelled, reaching. The white one, fool, the white one. I jumped, catching it and pulling down with all my weight, feeling it give. But this only increased the noise and I seemed to hear Brockway laugh as I looked around to see him scrambling for the stairs, his hands clasping the back of his head, and his neck pulled in close, like a small boy who has thrown a brick into the air. Hey you! Hey you! I yelled. Hey! But it was too late. All my movements seemed too slow, ran together. I felt the wheel resisting and tried vainly to reverse it and tried to let go and it's sticking to my palms and my fingers stiff and sticky, and I turned, running now, seeing the needle on one of the gauges swinging madly, like a beacon gone out of control, and trying to think clearly, my eyes darting here and there through the room of tanks and machines and up the stairs so far away and hearing the clear new note arising while I seemed to run swiftly up an incline and shot forward with sudden acceleration into a wet blast of black emptiness that was somehow a bath of whiteness. It was a fall into space that seemed not a fall but a suspension. Then a great weight landed upon me and I seemed to sprawl in an interval of clarity beneath a pile of broken machinery, my head pressed back against a huge wheel, my body splattered with a stinking goo. Somewhere an engine ground in furious futility, grating loudly until a pain shot around the curve of my head and bounced me off into blackness for a distance, only to strike another pain that lobbed me back. And in that clear instant of consciousness I opened my eyes to a blinding flash. Holding on grimly, I could hear the sound of someone waiting, sloshing, nearby, and an old man's garrulous voice saying, I told them these here young 1900 boys ain't no good for the job. They ain't got the nerves. Nah, sir, they just ain't got the nerves. I tried to speak, to answer, but something heavy moved again and I was understanding something fully and trying again to answer but seemed to sink to the center of a lake of heavy water and pause, transfixed and numb with the sense that I had lost irrevocably an important victory. Chapter 11 I was sitting in a cold, white rigid chair and a man was looking at me out of a bright third eye that glowed from the center of his forehead. He reached out, touching my skull gingerly, and said something encouraging, as though I were a child. His fingers went away. Take this, he said. It's good for you. I swallowed. Suddenly my skin itched, all over. I had on new overalls, strange white ones. The taste ran bitter through my mouth. My fingers trembled. A thin voice with a mirror on the end of it said, How is he? I don't think it's anything serious. Merely stunned. Should he be sent home now? No just to be certain we'll keep him here a few days. Want to keep him under observation. Then he may leave. Now I was lying on a cot, the bright eye still burning into mine, although the man was gone. It was quiet and I was numb. I closed my eyes only to be awakened. What is your name? A voice said. My head. I said. 
Yes, but your name? Address? My head, that burning guy. I said. I? Inside, I said. Shoot him up for an x-ray, another voice said. My head. Careful. Somewhere a machine began to hum and I distrusted the man and woman above me. They were holding me firm and it was fiery and above it all I kept hearing the opening motif of Beethoven's fifth, three short and one long buzz, repeated again and again in varying volume, and I was struggling and breaking through, rising up, to find myself lying on my back with two pink-faced men laughing down. Be quiet now, one of them said firmly. You'll be all right. I raised my eyes, seeing two indefinite young women in white, looking down at me. A third, a desert of heat waves away, sat at a panel arrayed with coils and dials. Where was I? From far below me a barber chair thumping began and I felt myself rise on the tip of the sound from the floor. A face was now level with mine, looking closely and saying something without meaning. A whirring began that snapped and cracked with static and suddenly I seemed to be crushed between the floor and ceiling. Two forces tore savagely at my stomach and back. A flash of cold-edged heat enclosed me. I was pounded between crushing electrical pressures, pumped between live electrodes like an accordion between a player's hands. My lungs were compressed like a bellows and each time my breath returned I yelled, punctuating the rhythmical action of the nodes. Hush, God damn it! one of the faces ordered. We're trying to get you started again. Now shut up. The voice throbbed with icy authority and I quieted and tried to contain the pain. I discovered now that my head was encircled by a piece of cold metal like the iron cap worn by the occupant of an electric chair. I tried unsuccessfully to struggle, to cry out. But the people were so remote, the pain so immediate. A face moved in and out of the circle of lights, peering for a moment then disappeared. A freckled, red-haired woman with gold nose glasses appeared, then a man with a circular mirror attached to his forehead, a doctor. Yes, he was a doctor and the women were nurses, it was coming clear. I was in a hospital. They would care for me. It was all geared toward the easing of pain. I felt thankful. I tried to remember how I'd gotten here, but nothing came. My mind was blank as though I had just begun to live. When the next face appeared I saw the eyes behind the thick glasses blinking as though noticing me for the first time. You're all right, boy. You're okay. You just be patient, said the voice, hollow with profound detachment. I seemed to go away, the lights receded like a taillight racing down a dark country road. I couldn't follow. A sharp pain stabbed my shoulder. I twisted about on my back fighting something I couldn't see. Then after a while my vision cleared. Now a man sitting with his back to me, manipulating dials on a panel. I wanted to call him, but the fifth symphony rhythm racked me, and he seemed too serene and too far away. Bright metal bars were between us and when I strained my neck around I discovered that I was not lying on an operating table but in a kind of glass and nickel box, the lid of which was propped open. Why was I here? Doctor. Doctor. I called. No answer. Perhaps he hadn't heard, I thought, calling again and feeling the stabbing pulses of the machine again and feeling myself going under and fighting against it and coming up to hear voices carrying on a conversation behind my head. The static sounds became a quiet drone. Strains of music, a Sunday air, drifted from a distance. With closed eyes, Barely breathing I warded off the pain. The voices droned harmoniously. Was it a radio I heard, a phonograph? The vox humana of a hidden organ? If so, what organ and where? I felt warm. Green hedges, dazzling with red wild roses appeared behind my eyes, stretching with a gentle curving to an infinity empty of objects, a limpid blue space. Scenes of a shaded lawn in summer drifted past. I saw a uniformed military band arrayed decorously in concert, each musician with well-oiled hair, heard a sweet voice trumpet rendering the holy city as from an echoing distance, buoyed by a choir of muted horns, and above, the mocking obligato of a mocking bird. I felt giddy. The air seemed to grow thick with fine white gnats, 
filling my eyes, boiling so thickly that the dark trumpeter breathed them in and expelled them through the bell of his golden horn, a live white cloud mixing with the tones upon the torpid air. I came back. The voices still droned above me and I disliked them. Why didn't they go away? Smug ones. Oh, doctor, I thought drowsily, did you ever wade in a brook before breakfast? Ever chew on sugar cane? You know, doc, the same fall day I first saw the hounds chasing black men in stripes and chains my grandmother sat with me and sang with twinkling eyes, God a mighty made a monkey God a mighty made a whale and God a mighty made a gator with hickeys all over his tail. Or you, nurse. Did you know that when you strolled in pink organdian picture hat between the rows of cape jasmine, cooing to your bow in a drawl as thick as sorghum, we little black boys hidden snug in the bushes called out so loud that you dared hear, did you ever see Miss Margaret boil water? Man, she hisses a wonderful stream, seventeen miles and a quarter, man, and you can't see her pot for the steam. But now the music became a distinct wail of female pain. I opened my eyes. Glass and metal floated above me. How are you feeling, boy? A voice said. A pair of eyes peered down through lenses as thick as the bottom of a Coca-Cola bottle, eyes protruding, luminous and veined, like an old biology specimen preserved in alcohol. I don't have enough room, I said angrily. Oh, that's a necessary part of the treatment. But I need more room, I insisted. I'm cramped. Don't worry about it, boy. You'll get used to it after a while. How is your stomach and head? Stomach? Yes, and your head? I don't know, I said, realizing that I could feel nothing beyond the pressure around my head and the tender surface of my body. Yet my senses seemed to focus sharply. I don't feel it, I cried, alarmed. Aha! Uh -huh. You see. My little gadget will solve everything. He exploded. I don't know, another voice said. I think I still prefer surgery. And in this case especially, with this, uh, background, I'm not so sure that I don't believe in the effectiveness of simple prayer. Nonsense, from now on do your praying to my little machine. I'll deliver the cure. I don't know, but I believe it a mistake to assume that solutions, cures, that is, that apply in, uh, primitive instances, are, uh, equally effective when more advanced conditions are in question. Suppose it were a New Englander with a Harvard background? Now you're arguing politics, the first voice said banteringly. Oh, no, but it is a problem. I listened with growing uneasiness to the conversation fuzzing away to a whisper. Their simplest words seemed to refer to something else, as did many of the notions that unfurled through my head. I wasn't sure whether they were talking about me or someone else. Some of it sounded like a discussion of history. The machine will produce the results of a prefrontal lobotomy without the negative effects of the knife, the voice said. You see, instead of severing the prefrontal lobe, a single lobe, that is, we apply pressure in the proper degrees to the major centers of nerve control, our concept is gestalt and the result is as complete a change of personality as you'll find in your famous fairy tale cases of criminals transformed into amiable fellows after all that bloody business of a brain operation. And what's more, the voice went on triumphantly, the patient is both physically and neurally whole. But what of his psychology? Absolutely of no importance. The voice said. The patient will live as he has to live, and with absolute integrity. Who could ask more? He'll experience no major conflict of motives, and what is even better, society will suffer no trauma on his account. There was a pause. A pen scratched upon paper. Then, why not castration, doctor? A voice asked waggishly, causing me to start, a pain tearing through me. There goes your love of blood again, the first voice laughed. What's that definition of a surgeon, a butcher with a bad conscience? They laughed. It's not so funny. It would be more scientific to try to define the case. It has been developing some 300 years, define? Hell, man, we know all that. Then why don't you try more current? You suggest it? I do, why not? 
But isn't there a danger? The voice trailed off. I heard them move away, a chair scraped. The machine droned, and I knew definitely that they were discussing me and steeled myself for the shocks, but was blasted nevertheless. The pulse came swift and staccato, increasing gradually until I fairly danced between the nodes. My teeth chattered. I closed my eyes and bit my lips to smother my screams. Warm blood filled my mouth. Between my lids I saw a circle of hands and faces, dazzling with light. Some were scribbling upon charts. Look, he's dancing, someone called. No, really? An oily face looked in. They really do have rhythm, don't they? Get hot, boy. Get hot. It said with a laugh. And suddenly my bewilderment suspended and I wanted to be angry, murderously angry. But somehow the pulse of current smashing through my body prevented me. Something had been disconnected. For though I had seldom used my capacities for anger and indignation, I had no doubt that I possessed them, and, like a man who knows that he must fight, whether angry or not, when called a son of a bitch, I tried to imagine myself angry, only to discover a deeper sense of remoteness. I was beyond anger. I was only bewildered and those above seemed to sense it. There was no avoiding the shock and I rolled with the agitated tide, out into the blackness. When I emerged, the lights were still there. I lay beneath the slab of glass, feeling deflated. All my limbs seemed amputated. It was very warm. A dim white ceiling stretched far above me. My eyes were swimming with tears. Why, I didn't know. It worried me. I wanted to knock on the glass to attract attention, but I couldn't move. The slightest effort, hardly more than desire, tired me. I lay experiencing the vague processes of my body. I seemed to have lost all sense of proportion. Where did my body end and the crystal and white world begin? Thoughts evaded me, hiding in the vast stretch of clinical whiteness to which I seemed connected only by a scale of receding grays. No sounds beyond the sluggish inner roar of the blood. I couldn't open my eyes. I seemed to exist in some other dimension, utterly alone, until after a while a nurse bent down and forced a warm fluid between my lips. I gagged, swallowed, feeling the fluid course slowly to my vague middle. A huge iridescent bubble seemed to enfold me. Gentle hands moved over me, bringing vague impressions of memory. I was laved with warm liquids, felt gentle hands move through the indefinite limits of my flesh. The sterile and weightless texture of a sheet enfolded me. I felt myself bounce, sail off like a ball thrown over the roof into mist, striking a hidden wall beyond a pile of broken machinery and sailing back. How long it took, I didn't know. But now above the movement of the hands I heard a friendly voice uttering familiar words to which I could assign no meaning. I listened intensely, aware of the form and movement of sentences and grasping the now subtle rhythmical differences between progressions of sound that questioned and those that made a statement. But still their meanings were lost in the vast whiteness in which I myself was lost. Other voices emerged. Faces hovered above me like inscrutable fish peering myopically through a glass aquarium wall. I saw them suspended motionless above me, then two floating off, first their heads, then the tips of their fin-like fingers, moving dreamily from the top of the case. A thoroughly mysterious coming and going, like the surging of torpid tides. I watched the two make furious movements with their mouths. I didn't understand. They tried again, the meaning still escaping me. I felt uneasy. I saw a scribbled card, held over me all a jumble of alphabets. They consulted heatedly. Somehow I felt responsible. A terrible sense of loneliness came over me, they seemed to enact a mysterious pantomime. And seeing them from this angle was disturbing. They appeared daughterly stupid and I didn't like it. It wasn't right. I could see smut in one doctor's nose, a nurse had two flabby chins. Other faces came up, their mouths working with soundless fury. But we are all human, I thought, wondering what I meant. A man dressed in black appeared, a long-haired fellow, whose piercing eyes looked down upon me out of an intense and friendly face. The others hovered about him, 
their eyes anxious as he alternately peered at me and consulted my chart. Then he scribbled something on a large card and thrust it before my eyes, what is your name? A tremor shook me, it was as though he had suddenly given a name to, had organized the vagueness that drifted through my head, and I was overcome with swift shame. I realized that I no longer knew my own name. I shut my eyes and shook my head with sorrow. Here was the first warm attempt to communicate with me and I was failing. I tried again, plunging into the blackness of my mind. It was no use, I found nothing but pain. I saw the card again and he pointed slowly to each word, what is your name? I tried desperately, diving below the blackness until I was limp with fatigue. It was as though a vein had been opened and my energy siphoned away, I could only stare back mutely. But with an irritating burst of activity he gestured for another card and wrote, WHO? R? You? Something inside me turned with a sluggish excitement. This phrasing of the question seemed to set off a series of weak and distant lights where the other had thrown a spark that failed. Who am I? I asked myself. But it was like trying to identify one particular cell that coursed through the torpid veins of my body. Maybe I was just this blackness and bewilderment and pain, but that seemed less like a suitable answer than something I'd read somewhere. The card was back again, what is your mother's name? Mother. Who is my mother? Mother, the one who screams when you suffer, but who? This was stupid, you always knew your mother's name. Who was it that screamed? Mother? But the scream came from the machine. A machine my mother? Clearly, I was out of my head. He shot questions at me, where were you born? Try to think of your name. I tried, thinking vainly of many names, but none seemed to fit and yet it was as though I was somehow a part of all of them, had become submerged within them and lost. You must remember, the placard read. But it was useless. Each time I found myself back in the clinging white mist and my name just beyond my fingertips. I shook my head and watched him disappear for a moment and return with a companion, a short, scholarly-looking man who stared at me with a blank expression. I watched him produce a child's slate and a piece of chalk, writing upon it, who was your mother? I looked at him, feeling a quick dislike and thinking, half in amusement, I don't play the dozens. And how's your old lady today? Think I stared, seeing him frown and write a long time. The slate was filled with meaningless names. I smiled, seeing his eyes blaze with annoyance. Old friendly face said something. The new man wrote a question at which I stared in wide-eyed amazement, who was Buckeye the rabbit? I was filled with turmoil. Why should he think of that? He pointed to the question, word by word. I laughed, deep, deep inside me, giddy with the delight of self-discovery and the desire to hide it. Somehow I was Buckeye the rabbit. Or had been, when as children we danced and sang barefoot in the dusty streets, Buckeye the rabbit shake it. Shake it Buckeye the rabbit break it, break it. Yet, I could not bring myself to admit it, it was too ridiculous, and somehow too dangerous. It was annoying that he had hit upon an old identity and I shook my head, seeing him purse his lips and eye me sharply. Boy, who was Burr Rabbit? He was your mother's backdoor man, I thought. Anyone knew they were one and the same. Buckeye when you were very young and hid yourself behind wide innocent eyes, brr, when you were older. But why was he playing around with these childish names? Did they think I was a child? Why didn't they leave me alone? I would remember soon enough when they let me out of the machine. A palm smacked sharply upon the glass, but I was tired of them. Yet as my eyes focused upon old friendly face he seemed pleased. I couldn't understand it. But there he was, smiling and leaving Whiter the new assistant. Left alone, I lay fretting over my identity. I suspected that I was really playing a game with myself and that they were taking part. A kind of combat. Actually they knew as well as I, and I for some reason preferred not to face it. It was irritating, and it made me feel sly and alert. I would solve the mystery the next instant. 
I imagined myself whirling about in my mind like an old man attempting to catch a small boy in some mischief, thinking, who am I? It was no good. I felt like a clown. Nor was I up to being both criminal and detective, though why criminal I didn't know. I fell to plotting ways of short-circuiting the machine. Perhaps if I shifted my body about so that the two nodes would come together, no, not only was there no room but it might electrocute me. I shuddered. Whoever else I was, I was no Samson. I had no desire to destroy myself even if it destroyed the machine, I wanted freedom, not destruction. It was exhausting, for no matter what the scheme I conceived, there was one constant flaw, myself. There was no getting around it. I could no more escape than I could think of my identity. Perhaps, I thought, the two things are involved with each other. When I discover who I am, I'll be free. It was as though my thoughts of escape had alerted them. I looked up to see two agitated physicians and a nurse, and thought, it's too late now, and lay in a veil of sweat watching them manipulate the controls. I was braced for the usual shock, but nothing happened. Instead I saw their hands at the lid, loosening the bolts, and before I could react they had opened the lid and pulled me erect. What's happened? I began, seeing the nurse pause to look at me. Well? She said. My mouth worked soundlessly. Come on, get it out, she said. What hospital is this? I said. It's the factory hospital, she said. Now be quiet. They were around me now, inspecting my body and I watched with growing bewilderment, thinking, what is a factory hospital? I felt a tug at my belly and looked down to see one of the physicians pull the cord which was attached to the stomach node, jerking me forward. What is this? I said. Get the shears, he said. Sure, the other said. Let's not waste time. I recoiled inwardly as though the cord were part of me. Then they had it free and the nurse clipped through the belly band and removed the heavy node. I opened my mouth to speak but one of the physicians shook his head. They worked swiftly. The nodes off, the nurse went over me with rubbing alcohol. Then I was told to climb out of the case. I looked from face to face, overcome with indecision. For now that it appeared that I was being freed, I dared not believe it. What if they were transferring me to some even more painful machine? I sat there, refusing to move. Should I struggle against them? Take his arm, one of them said. I can do it, I said, climbing fearfully out. I was told to stand while they went over my body with the stethoscope. How's the articulation? The one with the chart said as the other examined my shoulder. Perfect, he said. I could feel a tightness there but no pain. I'd say he's surprisingly strong, considering, the other said. Shall we call in Drexel? It seems rather unusual for him to be so strong. No, just note it on the chart. All right, nurse, give him his clothes. What are you going to do with me? I said. She handed me clean underclothing and a pair of white overalls. No questions, she said. Just dress as quickly as possible. The air outside the machine seemed extremely rare. When I bent over to tie my shoes I thought I would faint, but fought it off. I stood shakily and they looked me up and down. Well, boy, it looks as though you're cured, one of them said. You're a new man. You came through fine. Come with us, he said. We went slowly out of the room and down a long white corridor into an elevator, then swiftly down three floors to a reception room with rows of chairs. At the front were a number of private offices with frosted glass doors and walls. Sit down there, they said. The director will see you shortly. I sat, seeing them disappear inside one of the offices for a second and emerge, passing me without a word. I trembled like a leaf. Were they really freeing me? My head spun. I looked at my white overalls. The nurse said that this was the factory hospital. Why couldn't I remember what kind of factory it was? And why a factory hospital? Yes. I did remember some vague factory, perhaps I was being sent back there. Yes, and he'd spoken of the director instead of the head doctor, could they be one and the same? Perhaps I was in the factory already. I listened but could hear no machinery. 
Across the room a newspaper lay on a chair, but I was too concerned to get it. Somewhere a fan droned. Then one of the doors with frosted glass was opened and I saw a tall austere looking man in a white coat, beckoning to me with a chart. Come, he said. I got up and went past him into a large simply furnished office, thinking, now, I'll know. Now. Sit down, he said. I eased myself into the chair beside his desk. He watched me with a calm, scientific gaze. What is your name? Oh here, I have it, he said, studying the chart. And it was as though someone inside of me tried to tell him to be silent, but already he had called my name and I heard myself say, oh. As a pain stabbed through my head and I shot to my feet and looked wildly around me and sat down and got up and down again very fast, remembering. I don't know why I did it, but suddenly I saw him looking at me intently, and I stayed down this time. He began asking questions and I could hear myself replying fluently, though inside I was reeling with swiftly changing emotional images that shrilled and chattered, like a soundtrack reversed at high speed. Well, my boy, he said, you're cured. We are going to release you. How does that strike you? Suddenly I didn't know. I noticed a company calendar beside a stethoscope and a miniature silver paintbrush. Did he mean from the hospital or from the job? Sir? I said. I said, how does that strike you? All right, sir, I said in an unreal voice. I'll be glad to get back to work. He looked at the chart, frowning. You'll be released, but I'm afraid that you'll be disappointed about the work, he said. What do you mean, sir? You've been through a severe experience, he said. You aren't ready for the rigors of industry. Now I want you to rest, undertake a period of convalescence. You need to become readjusted and get your strength back. But, sir, you mustn't try to go too fast. You're glad to be released, are you not? Oh, yes. But how shall I live? Live? His eyebrows raised and lowered. Take another job, he said. Something easier, quieter. Something for which you're better prepared. Prepared? I looked at him, thinking, is he in on it too? I'll take anything, sir, I said. That isn't the problem, my boy. You just aren't prepared for work under our industrial conditions. Later, perhaps, but not now. And remember, you'll be adequately compensated for your experience. Compensated, sir? Oh. Yes, he said. We follow a policy of enlightened humanitarianism, all our employees are automatically insured. You have only to sign a few papers. What kind of papers, sir? We require an affidavit releasing the company of responsibility, he said. Yours was a difficult case, and a number of specialists had to be called in. But, after all, any new occupation has its hazards. They are part of growing up of becoming adjusted, as it were. One takes a chance and while some are prepared, others are not. I looked at his lined face. Was he doctor, factory official, or both? I couldn't get it, and now he seemed to move back and forth across my field of vision, although he sat perfectly calm in his chair. It came out of itself, do you know Mr. Norton, sir? I said. Norton? His brows knitted. What Norton is this? Then it was as though I hadn't asked him, the name sounded strange. I ran my hand over my eyes. I'm sorry, I said. It occurred to me that you might. He was just a man I used to know. I see. Well, he picked up some papers, so that's the way it is, my boy. A little later perhaps we'll be able to do something. You may take the papers along if you wish. Just mail them to us. Your check will be sent upon their return. Meanwhile, take as much time as you like. You'll find that we are perfectly fair. I took the folded papers and looked at him for what seemed to be too long a time. He seemed to waver. Then I heard myself say, do you know him? My voice rising. Who? Mr. Norton, I said. Mr. Norton. Oh, why, no. No, I said, no one knows anybody and it was too long a time ago. He frowned and I laughed. They picked poor Robin clean, I said. Do you happen to know Bled? 
He looked at me, his head to one side. Are these people friends of yours? Friends? Oh, yes, I said, we're all good friends. Buddies from way back. But I don't suppose we get around in the same circles. His eyes widened. No, he said, I don't suppose we do. However, good friends are valuable to have. I felt lightheaded and started to laugh and he seemed to waver again and I thought of asking him about Emerson, but now he was clearing his throat and indicating that he was finished. I put the folded papers in my overalls and started out. The door beyond the rows of chairs seemed far away. Take care of yourself, he said. And you, I said, thinking, it's time, it's past time. Turning abruptly, I went weakly back to the desk seeing him looking up at me with his steady scientific gaze. I was overcome with ceremonial feelings but unable to remember the proper formula. So as I deliberately extended my hand I fought down laughter with a cough. It's been quite pleasant, our little palaver, sir, I said. I listened to myself and to his answer. Yes, indeed, he said. He shook my hand gravely, without surprise or distaste. I looked down. He was there somewhere behind the lined face and outstretched hand. And now our palaver is finished, I said. Goodbye. He raised his hand. Goodbye, he said, his voice noncommittal. Leaving him and going out into the paint fuming air I had the feeling that I had been talking beyond myself, had used words and expressed attitudes not my own, that I was in the grip of some alien personality lodged deep within me. Like the servant about whom I'd read in psychology class who, during a trance, had recited pages of Greek philosophy which she had overheard one day while she worked. It was as though I were acting out a scene from some crazy movie. Or perhaps I was catching up with myself and had put into words feelings which I had hitherto suppressed. Or was it, I thought, starting up the walk, that I was no longer afraid? I stopped looking at the buildings down the bright street slanting with sun and shade. I was no longer afraid. Not of important men, not of trustees and such, for knowing now that there was nothing which I could expect from them, there was no reason to be afraid. Was that it? I felt lightheaded, my ears were ringing. I went on. Along the walk the buildings rose, uniform and close together. It was days and now and on top of every building the flags were fluttering and diving down, collapsing. And I felt that I would fall, had fallen, moved now as against a current sweeping swiftly against me. Out of the grounds and up the street I found the bridge by which I'd come, but the stairs leading back to the car that crossed the top were too dizzily steep to climb, swim or fly, and I found a subway instead. Things whirled too fast around me. My mind went alternately bright and blank in slow rolling waves. We, he, him, my mind and I, were no longer getting around in the same circles. Nor my body either. Across the aisle a young platinum blonde nibbled at a red delicious apple as station lights rippled past behind her. The train plunged. I dropped through the roar, giddy and vacuum-minded, sucked under and out into late afternoon Harlem, Chapter 12. When I came out of the subway, Lenox Avenue seemed to careen away from me at a drunken angle, and I focused upon the teetering scene with wild, infant's eyes, my head throbbing. Two huge women with spoiled cream complexions seemed to struggle with their massive bodies as they came past, their flowered hips trembling like threatening flames. Out across the walk before me they moved, and a bright orange slant of sun seemed to boil up and I saw myself going down my legs watery beneath me, but my head clear, too clear, recording the crowd swerving around me, legs, feet, eyes, hands, bent knees, scuffed shoes, teethy-eyed excitement, and some moving on unhalting. And the big dark woman saying, boy, is you all right, what's wrong? In a husky voiced contralto. And me saying, I'm all right, just weak, and trying to stand, and her saying, why don't you all stand back and let the man breathe? Stand back there y'all, and now echoed by an official tone, keep moving, break it up. And she on one side and a man on the other, helping me to stand and the policeman saying, are you all right? And me answering, yes, 
I just felt weak, must have fainted but all right now, and him ordering the crowd to move on and the others moving on except the man and woman and him saying, you sure you okay, daddy, and me nodding yes, and her saying, where you live son, somewhere around here. And me telling her man's house and her looking at me shaking her head saying, man's house, man's house, shucks that ain't no place for nobody in your condition what's weak and needs a woman to keep an eye on you a while. And me saying, but I'll be alright now, and her, maybe you will and maybe you won't. I live just up the street and round the corner, you better come on round and rest till you feel stronger. I'll phone men's house and tell em where you at. And me too tired to resist and already she had one arm and was instructing the fellow to take the other and we went, me between them, inwardly rejecting and yet accepting her bossing, hearing, you take it easy, I'll take care of you like I done a heap of others, my name's Mary Rambo, everybody knows me round this part of Harlem, you heard of me, ain't you? And the fellow saying, sure, I'm Jenny Jackson's boy, you know I know you, Miss Mary. And her saying, Jenny Jackson, why, I should say you do know me and I know you, you Ralston, and your mama got two more children, boy named Flint and gal named Lorigen, I should say I know you, me and your mama and your papa Usada, and me saying, I'm all right now, really all right. And her saying, and looking like that, you must be worse off even than you look, and pulling me now saying, here's my house right here, help me get him up the steps and inside. You needn't worry, son, I ain't never laid eyes on you before and it ain't my business and I don't care what you think about me but you weak and can't hardly walk and all and you look what's more like you hungry, so just come on and let me do something for you like I hope you'd do something for a lay Mary in case she needed it, it ain't costing you a penny and I don't want to get in your business, I just want you to lay down till you rested and then you can go. And the fellow taking it up, saying, you in good hands, daddy, Miss Mary always helping somebody and you need some help cause here you black as me and white as a sheet, as the Ophase would say, watch these steps. And going up some steps and then some more, growing weaker, and the two warm around me on each side of me, and then inside a cool dark room, hearing, here, here's the bed, lie him down there, there, there now, that's it, Ralston, now put his legs up. Never mind the cover, there, that's it, now go out there in the kitchen and pour him a glass of water, you'll find a bottle in the icebox. And him going and her placing another pillow beneath my head, saying, now you'll be better and when you get all right you'll know how bad a shape you've been in, here, now talk a sip of this water, and me drinking and seeing her worn brown fingers holding the bright glass and a feeling of old almost forgotten relief coming over me and thinking in echo of her words, if I don't think I'm sinking, look what a hole I'm in, and then the soft cool splash of sleep. I saw her across the room when I awoke, reading a newspaper, her glasses low across the bridge of her nose as she stared at the page intently. Then I realized that though the glasses still slanted down, the eyes were no longer focused on the page, but on my face and lighting with a slow smile. How you feel now? She said. Much better. I thought you would be. And you be even better after you have a cup of soup I got for you in the kitchen. You slept a good long time. Did I? I said. What time is it? It's about ten o'clock, and from the way you slept I suspects all you needed was some rest. No, don't get up yet. You got to drink your soup, then you can go, she said, leaving. She returned with a bowl in a plate. This here'll fix you up, she said. You don't get this kind of service up there at men's house, do you? Now, you just sit there and take your time. I ain't got nothing to do but read the paper. And I like company. You have to make time in the morning? No, I've been sick, I said. But I have to look for a job. I knowed you wasn't well. Why you try to hide it? I didn't want to be trouble to anyone, I said. Everybody has to be trouble to somebody. And you just come from the hospital too. I looked up. She sat in the rocking chair bent forward, her arms folded at ease across her apron lap. Had she searched my pockets? How did you know that? I said. 
There you go getting suspicious, she said sternly. That's what's wrong with the world today, don't nobody trust nobody. I can smell that hospital smell on you, son. You got enough ether in those clothes to put to sleep a dog. I couldn't remember telling you that I had been in the hospital. No, and you didn't have to. I smelled that out. You got people here in the city? No, Mom, I said. They're down south. I came up here to work so I could go to school, and I got sick. Now ain't that too bad. But you make out all right. What you plan to make out of yourself? I don't know now, I came here wanting to be an educator. Now I don't know. So what's wrong with being an educator? I thought about it while sipping the good hot soup. Nothing, I suppose, I just think I'd like to do something else. Well, whatever it is, I hope it's something that's a credit to the race. I hope so, I said. Don't hope, make it that way. I looked at her thinking of what I'd tried to do and of where it had gotten me, seeing her heavy, composed figure before me. It's you young folks what's going to make the changes, she said. Y'all's the ones. You got to lead and you got to fight and move us all on up a little higher. And I tell you something else, it's the ones from the south that's got to do it, them what knows the fire and ain't forgot how it burns. Up here too many frigates. They finds a place for themselves and frigates the ones on the bottom. Oh, heap of them talks about doing things, but they done really forgot. No, it's you young ones what has to remember and take the lead. Yes, I said. And you have to take care of yourself, son. Don't let this Harlem get you. I'm in New York but New York ain't in me, understand what I mean? Don't get corrupted. I won't. I'll be too busy. All right now, you looks to me like you might make something out of yourself, so you'll be careful. I got up to go watching her raise herself out of her chair and come with me to the door. You ever decide you want a room somewhere beside men's house, try me, she said. The rent's reasonable. I'll remember that, I said. I was to remember sooner than I had thought. The moment I entered the bright, buzzing lobby of men's house I was overcome by a sense of alienation and hostility. My overalls were causing stares and I knew that I could live there no longer that that phase of my life was past. The lobby was the meeting place for various groups still caught up in the illusions that had just been boomeranged out of my head, college boys working to return to school down south, older advocates of racial progress with utopian schemes for building black business empires, preachers ordained by no authority except their own, without church or congregation, without bread or wine, body or blood the community leaders without followers, old men of 60 or more still caught up in post-Civil War dreams of freedom within segregation, the pathetic ones who possessed nothing beyond their dreams of being gentlemen, who held small jobs or drew small pensions, and all pretending to be engaged in some vast, though obscure, enterprise, who affected the pseudo-courtly manners of certain southern congressmen and bowed and nodded as they passed like senile old roosters in a barnyard, the younger crowd for whom I now felt a contempt such as only a disillusioned dreamer feels for those still unaware that they dream, the business students from southern colleges, for whom business was a vague, abstract game with rules as obsolete as Noah's Ark but who yet were drunk on finance. Yes and that older group with similar aspirations, the fundamentalists, the actors who sought to achieve the status of brokers through imagination alone, a group of janitors and messengers who spent most of their wages on clothing such as was fashionable among Wall Street brokers, with their Brooks Brothers suits and bowler hats, English umbrellas, black calfskin shoes and yellow gloves, with their orthodox and passionate argument as to what was the correct tie to wear with what shirt. What shade of grey was correct for spats and what would the Prince of Wales wear at a certain seasonal event, should field glasses be slung from the right or from the left shoulder, who never read the financial pages though they purchased the Wall Street Journal religiously and carried it beneath the left elbow, pressed firm against the body and grasped in the left hand, always manicured and gloved, fair weather or foul, with an easy precision, oh, they had style.
while the other hand whipped a tightly rolled umbrella back and forth at a calculated angle, with their Homburgs and Chesterfields, their polo coats and Tyrolean hats worn strictly as fashion demanded. I could feel their eyes, saw them all and saw to the time when they would know that my prospects were ended and saw already the contempt they'd feel for me, a college man who had lost his prospects and pride. I could see it all and I knew that even the officials and the older men would despise me as though, somehow, in losing my place in Bledsoe's world I had betrayed them. I saw it as they looked at my overalls. I had started toward the elevator when I heard the voice raised in laughter and turned to see him holding forth to a group in the lobby chairs and the rolls of fat behind the wrinkled, high-domed, close-cut head and I was certain that it was he and stooped without thought and lifted it shining, full and foul, and moved forward two long steps, dumping its great brown, transparent splash upon the head worn too late by someone across the room. And too late for me to see that it was not Bledsoe but a preacher, a prominent Baptist, who shot up wide-eyed with disbelief and outrage, and I shot around and out of the lobby before anyone could think to stop me. No one followed me and I wandered the streets amazed at my own action. Later it began to rain and I sneaked back near men's house and persuaded an amused porter to slip my things out to me. I learned that I had been barred from the building for 99 years and a day. You might not can come back, man, the porter said, but after what you did, I swear, they never will stop talking about you. You really baptized Ole Rev. So that same night I went back to Mary's, where I lived in a small but comfortable room until the ice came. It was a period of quietness. I paid my way with my compensation money and found living with her pleasant except for her constant talk about leadership and responsibility. And even this was not too bad as long as I could pay my way. It was, however, a small compensation and when after several months my money ran out and I was looking again for a job, I found her exceedingly irritating to listen to. Still, she never dunned me and was as generous with her servings of food during mealtime as ever. It's just hard times you going through, she'd say. Everybody worth his salt has his hard times, and when you get to be somebody you'll see these here very same hard times helped you a heap. I didn't see it that way. I had lost my sense of direction. I spent my time, when not looking for work, in my room, where I read countless books from the library. Sometimes, when there was still money, or when I had earned a few dollars waiting table, I'd eat out and wander the streets until late at night. Other than Mary the first had no friends and desired none. Nor did I think of Mary as a friend, she was something more, a force, a stable familiar force like something out of my past which kept me from whirling off into some unknown which I dared not face. It was a most painful position, for at the same time, Mary reminded me constantly that something was expected of me, some act of leadership, some newsworthy achievement, and I was torn between resenting her for it and loving her for the nebulous hope she kept alive. I had no doubt that I could do something, but what, and how? I had no contacts and I believed in nothing. And the obsession with my identity which I had developed in the factory hospital returned with a vengeance. Who was I, how had I come to be? Certainly I couldn't help being different from when I left the campus, but now a new, painful, contradictory voice had grown up within me, and between its demands for revengeful action and Mary's silent pressure I throbbed with guilt and puzzlement. I wanted peace and quiet tranquility, but was too much a boil inside. Somewhere beneath the load of the emotion-freezing ice which my life had conditioned my brain to produce, a spot of black anger glowed and threw off a hot red light of such intensity that had Lord Kelvin known of its existence, he would have had to revise his measurements. A remote explosion had occurred somewhere, perhaps back at Emerson's or that night in Bledsoe's office and it had caused the ice cap to melt and shift the slightest bit. But that bit, that fraction, was irrevocable. Coming to New York had perhaps been an unconscious attempt to keep the old freezing unit going, but it hadn't worked, hot water had gotten into its coils. Only a drop, perhaps, but that drop was the first wave of the deluge. One moment I believed, I was dedicated, 
willing to lie on the blazing coals, do anything to attain a position on the campus, then snap. It was done with, finished, through. Now there was only the problem of forgetting it. If only all the contradictory voices shouting inside my head would come down and sing a song in unison, whatever it was I wouldn't care as long as they sang without dissonance, yes, and avoided the uncertain extremes of the scale. But there was no relief. I was wild with resentment but too much under self-control, that frozen virtue, that freezing vice. And the more resentful I became, the more my old urge to make speeches returned. While walking along the streets words would spill from my lips in a mumble over which I had little control. I became afraid of what I might do. All things were indeed awash in my mind. I longed for home. And while the ice was melting to form a flood in which I threatened to drown I awoke one afternoon to find that my first northern winter had set.